gostaria de me apresentar primeiro. Meu nome é Brian Morgan, sou professor de inglês e linguística aplicada pela Universidade de York, Campus London, em Toronto, Canadá. Bem, o título da minha palestra em inglês é Query the Syllabus. Exploring Needs and Rights in the EAP Contact Zone. Um, a palavra queer é muito importante para a minha fala nesta tarde. Está entendendo? Bom, antes de começarmos, eu gostaria de falar um pouco sobre a palavra queer. Esta palavra vem da teoria post-estructuralista de Foucault e Derrida. Segundo logo, queer pode ser traduzido por estranho, talvez ridículo, excêntrico, raro, extraordinário. A pedagogia do queer não é simplesmente aceitar ou tolerar o estilo de vida dos gays e das lésbicas. O mais importante na teoria é questionar todos os estilos de vida e como e por que elas se tornam naturais e normais dentro da so sociedade. Agora, eu vou falar em inglês que é muito mais fácil. <risos> Ah, fabulous audience, ok. <laughs> Now, this, this comes from my teaching and my interest in looking at lessons that are not just about grammar, not just about reading, not just about writing essays, but looking at multiple lessons, many lessons at the same time that involve the whole student. But we seem as, as a teacher, teacher educator, we are too focused on the short lesson. And we forget that there are many life lessons happening at the same time. And maybe they're more important than that very short lesson with very clear objectives. So this is a quote from Nelson. Cynthia Nelson, who is a leading scholar in queer theory, in applied linguistics. She's written many articles and a fabulous book uh, in 2009. So, Nelson correctly notes, oh, could you change that, sorry. I'm looking at a different screen. Nelson correctly notes a dearth of literature on teaching in a contact zone environment that is simultaneously transnational, transcultural, multilingual and multisexual. Now this idea, a zona de contato, is very interesting for me. In my school, I have students come from all over the world. They bring different values, beliefs, and different goals. And maybe in universities in Brazil, and also people from Canada. We forget that even in Canada, different areas of Canada. And maybe there are some similarities of the diversity here in Brazilian schools, maybe from different regions at larger universities. So students come to school and it's a challenge for them, not just learning a new language. They find their value, their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, their religion, their class, all of their beliefs are challenged at the university. They see posters all over the school advertising things they couldn't imagine in their first language and culture, and, and things that just never happened. And it forces them to say, what is this? Who are these people in the posters? And who am I in comparison? So this part of school, we forget about, but it's a big part, this zona de contact, big part education. Okay. Now there's one person that I will now talk about is Sarah Benish and she has an idea to help teachers think about 
two lessons at the same time. The lesson necessidades, necessity, needs, and direitos, which he calls rights. So Sir Benish is for English in universities to come up with an idea that she calls needs and rights assessment. Typically, we do assessment of what's the grammar level, the speaking level, what's the vocabulary level of the student. Sarah Benish says we also need to do rights assessment. How does the school support or not support the needs of the student? S schools are large. Our university, um, the big university, 35,000 students. It's a large bureaucracy. They sometimes, and we're at a smaller college, which is better, but the school forgets about the complex needs of students. So Benny says, teachers can also look at two lessons, academic needs, but academic rights. And part of that, she says, is issues of power, issues of identity. So she talks about, so I use her idea of needs and rights, and I will show you how I've used it to design my syllabus, part of my syllabus, or could it be all, I guess, here how I use her idea of needs and rights, and I will show you how literature was used, I hope, to open up new ways of thinking for the students. Okay, so I have here one of the examples is the development of conventional academic skills, and then there's the second one. Could you turn? Yeah. The other thing that I'm going to use Benish's idea for is an opportunity to explore previously invisible, subjugated, and often stigmatized identities. Youth, minority, homosexuality in particular, but in ways inspired by queer theory. Through descriptions and analyses of text selection, sequencing, and combination of language tasks, the order of the lessons, as well as essay prompts, I will describe the strengths and the weaknesses of my efforts in querying the syllabus, and I hope with some relevance or some ideas for Brazilian teachers to think about. Can we go to the next Okay. Now, part of needs assessment, when teachers have university students, we look at the idea of what are the language needs. And these are, this is a typical conventional idea. You have a description of the target language situation. What are the classes, disciplines? What are the kinds of display tasks? Will the, will the students be graded on essays, oral presentations, exams? So teachers make in ESL, second language teachers make inventories of the display needs, how they have to show their knowledge in English. So we make an inventory. And then you see also things like the assessment of the language learner we use, um, things like we assess their learning strategies, how do they learn, we look at language proficiency. And then we have those assessment tools at the bottom. We use things like surveys, questionnaires, some people will interview their students. We analyze institutional documents, course outlines and certain kinds of disciplinary genres, writing essays, writing short narratives, reflection papers, and display tasks. Okay, let's go on. I think I'm behind you. Okay. Now, let me talk a little bit about the target language situation. Let me see if I got the right one here. Yeah, so no, let's go back to that. That's good. That talks about Sarah Benish. No, let's go to the target language situation. Let's go on. Okay. So. There we are, needs and rights, yes. I, I think I'm ahead of that, but I'm looking at Sarah Benish's work. Okay. So Sarah Benish looks at 
needs and rights, and she makes in the second point the very, very important idea of identity negotiation through classroom reading, classroom engagement, all the things that happen in the class. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. Now, lost my place. So, and the last one, needs and rights, I'm sorry, can you go back again for that one? Yeah. Needs and rights in ERP, EAP are inseparable from issues of identity, identity negotiation. And academic tasks, and academic tasks are person formative, and that's the idea there at the bottom. Okay, so let's go on. So, Let's go now to the target language situation York University, the students are coming to. York was, oh I should read this, sorry. From, and this, is, this is the challenge as students come into the target language situation. They come, they come into a space where new kinds of binaries opposite so they come in the idea of a native speaker implies the idea of a non-native speaker so they have to decide where do i fit on these categories the idea of being a foreign student suggests a domestic student um, and these kind of ideas again going back to what benish says challenge students to think about who they are in the context of the class. And the interesting thing at the very end of this section, it talks about the identity politics of the university and the course requirements and materials to which they submit. So let me tell you a little bit about the target language situation that the students come to. So you have the classroom, where these readings challenge who we are, and then you have the school. York University was the second, I think the second university in Canada in 19, as early as 1970 to have a gay alliance or an official association for gay and lesbian rights. So, so students are coming to a school where there is a long history of supporting gay and lesbian rights. And even now, the association is involved in um, looking at issues of uh, employment equity around gay and lesbian issues. So students are coming to this environment where classroom materials and the official university policies and documents are or, or say that they support gay and lesbian rights. And students engage with that. But it's important to know that in the class, students' official policies do not necessarily mean official gay-friendly policies do not mean gay-friendly classrooms. The policies do not really, do not provide any direction for the teachers. And so this is, becomes a problem. And in fact, in many of my classes, students will read about gay and lesbian themes, not because they're open to difference, but in some ways to inform themselves or reinforce their own prejudices. So the classroom can be a very difficult space. And the use of literature and, and careful literature that explores these kinds of issues can be very effective. Okay, now how literature is used in the class is inspired by queer theory. And let's go to a couple of quotes that I like here. This is from a York University professor, Deborah Britzman, and she says at the top, thinking queerly about teaching, then, means not just including gay people, but prompting inquiry about the cultural and linguistic production of sexual identities 
in day-to-day -day practices and discourses. So a little bit what I was trying to say in Portuguese. Not just inclusion, but challenging all beliefs. And the second one, element, element. Queer theory is an attempt to move away from psychological explanations like homophobia. What's, what's the Portuguese word? Homophobia. So it tries to move away from psychological explanations which individualize and make it a product of the individual, not the society, which individualizes hex heterosexual fear and loathing toward gay and lesbian subjects at the expense of examining how heterosexual heterosexuality became normalized. That's a, a popular word by Foucault, normalized as natural. Not right. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, good. Now, Nelson has this point to say. I've lost my translation of it. <laughs> Okay. Here we are. Let's go on. It's hard. It's hard to do this. So, uh, sorry. Let's go back. And I think I'll, I'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next one. So. The final question, is there a queer pedagogy for English, for English language teaching? And how does this queer pedagogy align with conventional notions of methodology, second language acquisition, and second language teacher education, and um, linguistics and English language targets and ideas? Okay, now I'm going to show you a lesson, almost like a lesson plan, but it's a unit plan. And it is, this is an itinerary for a course, ESL 1000, nine credits. It's an inventory using Benish of necessidades y derechos, needs, traditional needs of the course, and with rights. So, you have things, the course is content. Students must do the same work as, as English speakers. They must do research, they must do essays, and they look at themes, Canadian history, current events, Quebec nationalism, multiculturalism, Aboriginal issues, gender issues in Canada, and they do language. We look at doing um, essays, oral presentations, we do pronunciation in class, we do grammar in class. Now at the same time, there's a second curriculum, and it is the curriculum of derechos. And it's taking up, what do we think about student identities? Canadian identity as contested, as a work in progress that being a Canadian, and students affirmed as active participants that their ideas are important and that the class takes that into account. Multisexualities affirmed as legitimate course content. And then two, students looking at language. Students valued as legitimate creators of knowledge and text and not as partially formed citizens due to their second language limitations. So even at the university level, I will sometimes ask students to use their first language to compare translations. So even at the university level, sometimes to show respect for the knowledge that the student might have but cannot say in the second language, I'm okay with, use your first language. There's nothing wrong with that. So this is an inventory. These are, again, parallel, two things happening at the same time. This is the way I conceptualize the class, and this is the space in which a unit on sexuality, on gay, lesbian, minority issues came into my classroom and how we integrated it. 
This course would be a full year. Students would meet twice a week, two hours each time, and it would be for 24 weeks from September to April. Okay, now the first reading is not really literature, but it's an, it was an excellent newspaper article by Paula Palette Payroll. And what was interesting about this, going back to, remember I was talking about being gay, not gay. Another issue was, who is gay? Students would often say, oh, in my culture, oh, we're Chinese, nobody's gay. Or, oh no, we're, we're, from the, we're from this part of the world, oh, no, nobody's gay. So these assumptions, what this article is so interesting about is that it's about minority homosexuality in Toronto. So and again, students are, are reading about problems, two problems that, that this quote says. They're reading about the problem of not being accepted, newcomers to Toronto not being accepted by their own ethnic community, but also not being accepted by the white gay community. So she writes about this, and it's a fascinating article. And I have here on the board, homosexuality is largely a taboo subject within ethnic communities. Yet at the same time, some visible minority gays charge that mainstream homosexual culture, while apparently liberal, liberal is in many ways racist and exclusionist marginalized within the mainstream queer culture, yet invisible within their own ethnic communities, minority gays find themselves trapped between two worlds that have traditionally excluded them. So it's an interesting art, engages students. And we do, you know, we do reading comprehension, we do discussion, so we do conventional work. But it challenges them because many students believe that again, my community, oh, there's no gays and lesbians. That's only in North America. So it's a really powerful article. Now, in the second term of the course, and I think this is a brilliant aspect of the course, is all the students are required to read a Canadian novel. And we spend, there's a lot of teachers in this course and a lot of time goes over, why did you pick this novel? So we introduce, in this course, Canadian literature, we pick a novel. And I always pick this article, this book, by Waste and Choi, called The Jay Peony. Um, and I'm going to show you some excerpts from it. There's a few things about the story that engage students, that make it really important. It's a story of immigration, of early Chinese Canadians, the problems they had for work, racism, um, problems of bringing other family members to Canada. And it's also really interesting for students because the story is told in three parts through the eyes and voice of three children. Through their lives. So again, for the students, there is a narrative of youth on display. A narrative of youth, a narrative of being a newcomer and not accepted as part of the story. So three children, three parts, three stories. The most interesting part for my queering the syllabus idea here is the second son, Jung Soon. Okay, good. We're on the same page. <laughs> okay. So let me read you a few parts. I've, I've given you some excerpts, and I will tell you why I think this story accomplishes, in part, the idea of queer, it, it, of queering literature, or for these students. So you see here. Popo -po is the grandmother, and she comments to a friend while watching Jung. This is the narrator of part two, shadow boxing in a fur coat given to him by Frank Yuen. Jung Sung is different, I heard her say to Mrs. Lim one day, inside, unusual, 
not ordinary. A little later she says. And then Jung Soon says, I am the sun, I said cheerfully, puffing away, breaking into their conversational dance. I'm the champion. Jung Soon is the moon. And then the grandmother said, Jung Soon is the moon. See, this is a Chinese idea. In Chinese um, tradition of yin and yang, yin is identified with the male character, masculinity. And yang, sorry, I've got it wrong. Yes, yin. The moon is the yin principle, the female principle. Right. Sorry. Okay. Let's go for it. Impossible. So I'm the sun, I said cheerfully, puffing away, breaking into their conversational dance. I'm the champion. Jung Sun is the moon, Popo -po said. The moon? Mrs. Lin blurted. Impossible. Mrs. Lim knew the moon was the yin principle, the female. Mrs. Lim studied me as I went through my paces, jabbing away at the air. He was a boxer. This is another interesting thing. He loved to box, fight. Impossible, she said. The old one lift, slowly lifted her teacup and gently focused on me, her gaze full of knowing mystery. Next page. Okay, and then later in the story, there's a fight between Frank Yuan, who Jung Sun admires. Frank taught Jung Sun how to box. And Jung Sun is trying to be a boxer. And then they get into this strange fight. One day, the older friend and mentor, Frank Yuan, is drunk and provokes a fight with Jung Sun as a test of the younger boy's masculinity. In the fight that ensues, Jung almost kills Frank with a knife. Just in time, Frank disarms Jung with a hard kick to the shoulder. Jung suddenly has a flashback to his abused childhood and begins to cry. The next section of the story. Shit, he said. You were going to kill me. I was on my knees. The tears began to fall. My chest began to heave. Okay, okay, he said. Come on, catch your breath. He knelt down to see how I was. He began to rock me. The slow rhythm of his rocking back and forth caught me off guard. I closed my eyes and moved with him, a child being cradled back and forth. As I too moved to get up, my whole body suddenly lit with an unbidden, shuddering tension. A strange yearning awoke in me. A vivid longing rose relentlessly in the center of my groin, sensuous and crazy. Related. Frank Ewan is the son, I remember thinking, and I remember the old one telling me, Mrs. Lim, telling Mrs. Lim, Jung Sung is the moon. Yes, I said to myself, as I finished putting on my coat and my armor, I am the moon. These are passages, they're not all together, but when you follow and, and you do reading prompts, the other interesting thing, nowhere in the story is the word gay ever mentioned. Nowhere in the story. So students are bringing and making their own meanings based on what they read. And so, could you turn to the next place? Post reading, and I never tell the students, say, oh, hi, everybody, I guess you know by now that Jung Soon is gay, no. We start to ask questions. What do you think of the story? We, we do little questions. What kind of character is this person? What, what vocabulary, what, what actions and effects describe the character? So, one of the comments right after the reading, very interesting, and I didn't start this, so one of the students says, is Jung Sung gay? And then Sumi, no, no, he can't be gay. He's a boxer. Boxer can be. But right away, deciding what does it mean? What are the what are the identities attached to these words? And then a little later on, one of the Chinese students said this. All Chinese know that we were both yin and yang. The grandmother is wrong to call Jung Sung yin. And then another Chinese student says, maybe she doesn't have the words to describe gay or homosexual. It doesn't mean he is not gay. So again, really interesting discussions, 
Some people shock. What do you mean he's gay? Later in the term, and then we had probably talked about about the book, why people felt that issues about the story, other characters. At the end of the term, one of the essay prompts for a term essay is is on sexuality or gay and lesbian issues in Canada. And this year, there were six students out of the class that picked this, picked this topic. And I'm sure that those students, without having those two readings, would not have chosen that topic for their final term essay. And for about five or six years, I would approximately have 10 to 20% of the students international students who never had an opportunity to talk about this, to learn about other invisible identities amongst their other students in the class. So in many ways, the second lesson, the parallel, the needs and the rights, to me, I think are evidence in fact the students found a place in which they could do academic language but explore identity at the same time. And I'm finished, I'll pick up.